Hi there, uh, John Hooper here. This session is about improvements in navigation. Here are some learning outcomes which you'll need to read through further. We're going to start off by looking at what contributes to the success of a maritime venture. The success of this can be measured against a number of benchmarks. Essentially, it's the economic success for all parties involved in the venture. That's the ship owner, the charterer, if that's relevant to uh, this particular venture, the cargo owner or shipper. In order to achieve this economic success, the cargo must arrive at its destination in good order. And to achieve this, the cargo must be stowed and carried correctly, and the ship must complete the voyage in a timely manner. And in order for the ship to complete the voyage in a timely manner, the ship must know three things. Where it is, i.e. position, where it is going, i.e. the course that it needs, and where other ships are located. In essence, that's collision avoidance. These navigational needs have always been the same. Regardless of the time in history, in essence, ever since the first two human beings sat on their separate logs and started to navigate around. It's only the methodology that has changed. Any improvement in navigational performance will also enhance the opportunity for the success of the venture. In the 21st century, the principal navigation tools are satellite position fixing system. From here on in, we'll talk about it as GPS. Echo sounder, radar, gyro compass, log, charts and publications. So let's look at those briefly all in turn. GPS. This provides a continuously updated position of the ship on a global basis, often with an accuracy of less than one meter. The important point here is continuously updated. It's real-time navigation. An echo sounder, a sonar device which provides a continuous indication of the depth of water below the ship's keel. Again, continuous is an important point to note. Radar enables the ship to detect the presence of other vessels and landmass when in fog or other conditions of restricted visibility. Correctly used, Radar assists the ship to fix position and avoid collision so that she can continue to navigate safely in these adverse conditions. A gyro compass provides a very reliable directional datum for steering purposes and also heading inputs to other navigational equipment. A ship's log is typically a sonar device which provides a continuous indication of the ship's current speed and a distance travelled from a specified point, typically on exit from the previous port. Charts and publications uh, provide information on the hydrography and topography to enable all vessels to navigate safely around the globe. Now whilst not strictly a navigational tool, there's some other equipment which also has an important role to play in a ship's trading capability. That's satellite communication systems and potentially automatic identification system. The COM system is capable of providing near global communications on demand for both ship to shore and shore to ship purposes. The automatic identification system automatically identifies ships to each other and to the shore authorities. Let's turn the clock back to 1977 to a voyage I undertook as a navigating officer on board a 21 knot reefer. That's a refrigerated cargo vessel. We were running from Nagoya in Japan to Aikiki in Chile with a cargo of cars. Given that the ship was a, a reefer, then the fact that we had a cargo of cars may seem rather strange. It certainly wasn't the cargo that the ship was built for. But this cargo paid the cost of the bunkers, that's the fuel oil, to reposition the ship to the eastern side of the Pacific Ocean. Here the ship could pick up the perishable cargoes 
for which he was designed and which commanded a much higher freight rate, that's earning capacity for the ship. A typical voyage pattern and cargo was Japan to South America with cars, South America to Central America in ballast, that's no cargo on board, Central America to the USA with bananas, and then the USA to Japan with citrus fruit. The principles of this voyage pattern are a modern example of the Silk Road of the Sea, a concept that you will explore in subsequent lectures. So let's look at the navigation from Nagoya to Aikikui. At 21 knots, the voyage time from Nagoya to Aikikui was approximately three weeks, with nothing to see but the horizon for the whole route. 1977 was in the pre-GPS era. Consequently, when out of sight of land, we fixed position by observation of the sun and stars, the celestial bodies. A sextant was used to measure the angle between the horizon and the celestial body at a specific time indicated by a chronometer. A chronometer is just a term for a very sophisticated wind-up clock. Calculations based on these observations were made using hard copy logarithm tables and an almanac providing details of the positions of the celestial bodies. Typically, it would take 30 minutes to observe and calculate a position using the stars, or some three hours to find a position when using the sun alone. Positions could generally be obtained three times a day, at dawn, noon and dusk. There are specific exceptions when the sun and another celestial body are visible during daytime. At best, the accuracy of the observed position was one mile. All depended upon being able to see both the celestial body and the horizon. If either were missing, then quite simply, no position. At that time, certainly in my experience, different part of the world, but it was quite common to cross the North Atlantic Ocean in winter without being able to obtain a single position whilst out of sight of land. Given the problems associated with obtaining a position when out of sight of land, then the most dangerous part of the voyage was making the transition from ocean navigation to coastal navigation. This is commonly termed making a landfall. None of the navigating officers on board our ship had been to Aikikui before. Consequently, and with very good reason, we were very cautious with our final approach. The coastline in the vicinity of Aikikui is orientated in a north-south direction and with respect to radar, it's featureless. Radar would provide an indication of the distance off the coast, in essence our longitude, but it would provide absolutely no indication of where we were along this coast, our latitude. The seabed doesn't significantly rise until close inshore, therefore the echo sounder will give little warning of grounding. The sailing directions, that's one of the Hydrographic Office publications, gave some detailed advice. It advised that coastal mountains behind Aikikui were basically featureless. And on closer approach, then three white patches on a point of land would give an indication of where we were. And also the fact that there was a railway ascending the coastline behind Aikikui was also a navigation mark. So you can see that from the sailing directions, highly detailed and unique information is captured. Originally, we were due to arrive during the hours of darkness, but in view of our navigational concerns, we slowed the ship down so that the final approach to Aikikui was made in daylight. On the morning of our arrival, the sky was clear and the white patches were clearly observed. Consequently, we were where our celestial observations indicated that we should be. With this initial confirmation that our celestial navigation had been correct, we continued our, our approach. The railway line became identifiable and we safely berthed in Aikikui. Had we had GPS, then arguably we wouldn't have lost this time waiting for daylight. In previous times, with the inferior equipment and data, then it wasn't just time that we would have lost, but potentially the ship, the cargo, and all on board. Consequently, even though this 
type of navigation isn't that old. You can see that it's had distinct problems. Consequently, an overview of the improvements in the quality of navigation and the consequential impact on the ship's trading ability is appropriate. Let's consider position fixing. And in the first instance, we'll look at line of position. That's an LOP, and we'll use that term from here on in. In ancient times, observation of natural phenomena, migratory bird routes, wave trains, wind directions, sea colour, were all used in determining position and direction of travel. However, this was based upon local knowledge. That's local knowledge in relative terms. The principles of position fixing suitable navigation on a global scale by a scientific observation have not essentially changed in centuries. In essence, it is the use of triangulation. If an object, a navigation mark, a navigation light or a celestial body is visible, positively identifiable, that is we know exactly what it is we're looking at, and its position is known either on a chart or in space, then this observation enables a line of position, an LOP, to be determined and drawn on the chart. And the ship's position will lie somewhere along this line. If we're using a celestial body, it happens to be a circle, which you can draw right around the Earth. If you're in coastal navigation, we can draw it as a straight line on the chart. In coastal navigation, we can take a compass bearing and we can draw this bearing on the chart. This line drawn on the chart is the LOP and will lie somewhere along that line. If we can ob obtain multiple LOPs at one time, and the figure indicates this, then we can get an LOP from each navigation mark. In this case, we've used three. And where those lines cross, that is the ship's position. For coastal navigation, consider the images we've got here. Lighthouses, light vessels, voyage, and latterly, electronic position fixing systems, they had a major impact on the safety of coastal navigation. For example, in 1977, it was quite possible to sail right around the coast of the UK without losing sight of a major lighthouse or light vessel. Today, the emphasis has shifted away from these sh traditional navigational aids for ships, not necessarily for recreational craft, but for ships, it's a move towards the use of electronic aids to fixing position. And typically that's what is termed a differential GPS. Something that's coming in the near future is e -Loran. It is the charting and provision of inf information relating to these aids to navigation and other navigationally significant objects that has improved. And these are considered further under charts and publications. If we turn our attention to ocean navigation, then the keynote changes in recent history are latitude sailing, determination of longitude, uh, which involved establishing time, and the nautical almanac, which provided information of the position in space of the celestial bodies. We could establish position from morning and noon sites, and in the 20th century, then along came the satellite systems. With latitude sailing, observation of the Sun and the Pole Star, the latter in the Northern Hemisphere only, to obtain latitude has been used since antiquity, as there is no requirement for accurate knowledge of the time to obtain the ship's latitude. And hopefully this is indicated in the diagram on the slide. Without an accurate knowledge of time, the navigation when out of sight of land was perilous at best. The practice was to navigate to a latitude, which when followed 
an east or west direction would lead the ship clear of a navigation hazard or into port. The danger here lay in knowing your longitude when you reached this parallel of latitude. Knowledge of longitude in these circumstances is obtained by the use of dead reckoning. A better name for that would probably be a best guess at where you are. Dead reckoning depended upon knowledge of ship's speed, distance travelled and the course made good or course over the ground since your last known position. And course made good required further knowledge of the effect of wind and surface currents on the ship's position. The instrumentation for determining speed was crude and similarly that for determining depth of water. The instruments for this are the log and the lead respectively. Data on surface currents was often sparse. Given that the length of ocean crossings under sail was measured in weeks and months rather than days, then the room for error in any dead reckoning calculation was significant. By way of example, I've had experience on a powerful modern ship capable of 22 knots, which was hove to, that's stopped. In storm force winds, this was when we were off the Bay of Biscay, several hundred miles out, and we suffered this for some two days. When the weather abated and we could fix position by the sun, we found that the ship in that time had travelled some 20 miles backwards. Consider if this had been a sailing vessel. What hope would she have had to accurately determine her longitude in these circumstances without the benefit of the knowledge of time that we had in the late 20th century? The determination of longitude was a long sought objective. And it was a loss of four warships of the Royal Navy, together with their crews of some 1,500 men in 1707, that prompted action on means to determine longitude. As it happens, it's debatable whether this knowledge of longitude alone would have assisted in this particular accident, but it's the lack of knowledge of an accurate position at all that did. The British Government's Longitude Act of 1714 offered a £20,000 prize, an enormous sum in its day, which would enable determination of longitude, but within certain constraints. There were two main contenders for this prize, as it turned out. The lunar distance method, that's a method of astronomical calculation which enables determination of the time at Greenwich Royal Observatory. And the marine chronometer, which provided direct knowledge of time. It was the chronometer which won the day, but not the prize as it turns out, but that's a topic for another lecture. The lunar method calculations were extremely complex, with many opportunities for error. Raper, quoted in Lecky's Wrinkles, stated, great practice is necessary for measuring the distance successfully and the application of so many small errors as are necessary where accuracy is required, even with extraordinary care and some skill, is scarcely compatible with extreme precision. In other words, it was very complex and the likelihood of success and the accuracy that was required was just not there. When the first practical chronometer was tested on an 81-day transatlantic voyage, it's found to have lost five seconds during the crossing, which by the time certain errors were taken into account that were known, then this equated to 1.25 minutes of longitude, approximately one nautical mile. This accuracy necessitated establishing the daily rate of the chronometer, that's a loss or gain in time per day, before departure, which could then be applied once at sea. Initially, the cost of chronometers was enormous, but subsequent developments reduced production costs and made them attainable and increased demand. In 1881, chronometers could be purchased new for £25 and for much less second hand. At this time, the majority of well found vessels carried three chronometers. If only two were carried, you wouldn't know which one was wrong. If there was a difference between only the two, but if you had three, 
then it would be clear which one of the three was in error. With the advent of radio time signals in later days, which enabled calibration of the chronometers on a daily basis from an external source, then it became common practice to carry two chronometers. Let's look at modern celestial navigation. Um, really, we need to put the term modern into context. And what we're talking about here is the 200-year period from 1770s through to the 1970s. It was at this latter date that celestial navigation became superseded by satellite navigation systems. There is a common misconception that once you know the time, then it is very easy to determine longitude at the time of attaining your latitude from the sun at noon. This is quite simply not the case. At noon, the rate of change of the sun's altitude is so slow that it is impossible to measure the exact time at which the sun is at its maximum height, i.e. when it's on the observer's meridian. So what happens in practice is that the approximate time of meridian passage will have been calculated in advance and you would commence checking the altitude about five minutes before the allotted time. As the sun gets higher in the sky, the measured angle increases on the sextant. You leave it set at that level, you never reduce it. Once the sun's altitude starts to fall, then you will know that the sun has started to move away from the meridian and you use this highest reading. But you don't need to know the exact time that this occurs. Hence, no accurate longitude can be obtained. But with knowledge of accurate time, then it is possible to attain LOPs from the full range of celestial bodies at other times of the day. And this leads us through then into the methodology for obtaining position from the sun. At any given time, it is only possible to get a single position line from a celestial body. And this will be at 90 degrees to the direction of the body from you. Consequently, at noon, when the sun is either directly north or south of you, then the line of position will run in an east-west direction, i.e. its latitude. Conversely, an ideal time to observe a celestial body to obtain longitude is when the body is directly east or west of you, as termed on the prime vertical. But with the sun, it is impractical, if not impossible, to achieve this. Nonetheless, it is impossible to obtain a line of position at other times. So this leads us to the running fix methodology, commonly turned sun run sun. Typically, the methodology is to take a morning sight. Usually three obs observations will be taken as close to together as possible, and if all three produce a similar result, then the accuracy is confirmed. If one of the sites is errant from the other two, then this result will be discarded and the two in agreement used. We then plot this LOP on a plotting chart, as indicated in the diagram. We would then calculate the time of local noon, that's meridian passage. So we'll use the term noon here on. And we'll calculate the distance that we run from the time of your morning sight to noon. Now in the course steered and distance run, we'd plot a dead reckoning position, that's a DR for noon. And this gives rise to the term running fix. And we'd plot the LOP from the morning site through this DR position. Any error in this DR position at noon will lie in the direction of the position line from the morning site. We would then observe and calculate the latitude at noon and plot this on the chart. And where the two LOPs cross provides the noon position. The accuracy of this sun run sun methodology is very dependent upon knowledge of the ship's speed and course made good over the time period between your morning sight and noon. And this will be determined by the accuracy of the log or other speed or 
and mm. distance measuring capabilities that you have. The helmsman or the autopilot's course keeping capability in the current conditions. Clearly in rough weather, there are likely to be unquantifiable errors between the course steered and the course made good. We'll also need data on surface ocean current prediction. If we can obtain simultaneous LOPs from the sun and the moon or the sun and one of the planets during the day, then where the two position lines cross is the ship's observed position. Multiple position lines can be obtained from the stars. However, remember that in order to observe the altitude of the star, then the horizon must also be visible. Consequently, this is not usually possible during night hours. An exception could be when there was sufficient moonlight to show up the horizon, but this will be unusual. So position fixing by the stars and also the planets. Normally it is only possible to see both the celestial body and the horizon during morning or evening twilight. And on each of these occasions, typically there will be a 20 minute period of opportunity to obtain your observations. When possible, a minimum of four observations will be taken from a selection of bright stars, i.e. those that are easily visible, which have a sufficient horizontal angle between them so that the plotted lines of position cross at the optimum angles. Star sites are considered to provide the most accurate position because other than the short distances run between the individual star observations, none of the inaccuracies associated with the running fix methodology occur. Reference to the completed plot on the slide shows you the methodology for obtaining position by stars at twilight. In my experience, star sites are also the method most likely to be affected by the environmental conditions. Given the short window of opportunity during twilight, if there is any momentary cloud cover, there will not be possible to take any ob observations. With the sun there is a greater window of opportunity, some two to three hours between the sites, so the, the potential for gaining positions is enhanced. And for some 200 years, these were the significant ocean position fixing methods that prevailed, and they carried on until they were superseded by the artificial stars, the satellites. Right, well I think we've covered enough there for the time being, so we'll take a break now.